There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Welcome, everybody, to the Your Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, David Wilms. I'm here, as always, with Mike McGrady. Hey, Dave. How's it going? I am tired, but I'm plugging along. Oh, very good. Yeah. Nephi Cole. Still here. Why? Because I love you guys. <laughs> I love you guys. Yeah. I can't help myself. I do. Yeah. Oh, we... Well, thanks. <laughs> 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 well, so, <laughs> so, I'm sorry. so we're bringing you some, uh, <laughs> so we're bringing you some new, new content tonight. Uh, for the past several weeks, we've been talking with a number of guests and we've, and we've had some great guests and we've talked to them about, uh, well, one of the things that comes up a lot is the Pittman Robertson Act. And we, we've, We've had some discussions about that, and we want to talk to you about that today. And this is going to be part of something that we're going to do about every other week, or the plan is actually every other week. We want to have a conversation about some issue that affects your land, your water, your wildlife, that affects you as somebody that appreciates those things on the, the national level or even even on a regional level. We're, today, we're going to talk about Pittman-Robertson Act. We're going to talk about how did it come into being, what does it do, and what is Congress looking to do to it now? So first of all, how did it come into being? And it's really, it, it, as complicated as it, as it is, it's really quite simple. Lots of you know, probably all of you know, that we spend a lot of time as a country in our early as we were growing as a country, exploiting wildlife, and we, we killed a lot of wildlife. Uh, and in response to the over-exploitation of wildlife with bison, deer, elk, turkeys, black bear, all those things, in response to that, states and the people in the states rose up and said, we need to fix this. We got to fix this. We got we to gotta protect this wildlife. And so they passed, states started passing laws in the later part of the 19th century started passing laws trying to address this, but there was no funding to back it up. There was no funding to back it up. There was no funding for law enforcement. There was no funding for management. So you had regulations being developed, but those regulations maybe potentially weren't effective because they didn't have the resources behind them to make them work. You got it. We have an example in Wyoming. We had, we had a law in 1890 that tried to stop bison hunts, right? Tried to stop bison hunts, but there was no funding behind it. it almost unenforceable. Right. And so states started to, to charge for hunting licenses and, and put together license fees and put together game and fish commissions and, and game and fish agencies and fish and game agencies to, to manage the wildlife, to have money for that wildlife. But the legislatures of these states started raiding those pots of money and started using them for other things. We needed to build roads. We needed to build rail. We needed to put basic water infrastructure. We, we had all sorts of things we were doing in early statehood that we needed this money for, and wildlife wasn't viewed as the most important thing. Yeah, you had uh, you know all important things, but those aren't necessarily the things that were generating the revenue, but that's what the revenue was being used for. Exactly. And that's not uncommon. It happens in other things still today where you, you take from certain accounts to, to fund other things. But the sportsman's community, the hunters and anglers at the time, rose up and said, this isn't right. We need help. They went to the federal government. They said, we need help. You know, and they did that in 19, well, they started doing it in the 30s. 1937, those efforts led to the adoption of the Pittman-Robertson Act. Or, you know, as it's, that's what it's commonly known as, but it was passed as the Federal Aid in Wildlife Restoration Act. Now, a note that you've brought up before, but it's probably important, is that there there already was an excise tax previously, so you're going to cover that. Yeah, there. so there so, was. There, so, so Pittman-Robertson, of course, is a tax on firearms, ammunition. Um, That's originally what what it was. Really, really it, was, it was long guns yep. and, and ammunition, and that tax was all going into the general treasury. So that was coming on before, Mike, right? 
Yeah, so that so it was something that was in existence, and it was funding the general treasury, and we're in the midst of a depression era, and uh, you know times are tight, and yet with this bill, they diverted that money out of the general treasury towards these conservation efforts. Yeah, and I think that's the one of the most amazing things. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, and you just touched on it. We we're right in the middle of the Great Depression. We needed this money for rebuilding the country. And instead, the sportsman's community said, you know what else we need? We need to rebuild our wildlife populations as well. And that's what we need this money for. And so this this act did that. And one of the sponsors, um, Senator, Senator Robertson, um, one of the sponsors of this act said, I'm not going to sponsor this act. I love this act. I think this is great. But we have a big problem with the states in that they're diverting this fund, you know, this money for other purposes. And so we're going to have this dedicated funding source, but how do we know that it's not going to go to the the states and be you know, and be used appropriately, right? Right. And so they actually put in a line that said the only way the state can get the, this money, these funds, is if they pass their own law that prevents the diversion of licensed dollars that the state receives from going to anything but managing for those wildlife populations in the state. Yeah, because otherwise if they just – if the federal government handed money over to the state, an equal amount of money that would have gone to the same efforts was going to get diverted for roads or something else unrelated to those things that we now accept are important for um, use of those license fees and dollars. That was pretty forward thinking. Right. Maybe yeah. Not pretty forward thinking. That was radically – Forward thinking. Yeah, you're creating an incentive, basically. We're saying the, you know, the purpose. So, uh, uh, you're adding money to the capacity to, to help wildlife, but you're also ensuring that you're not diverting the money that was being used by states for wildlife for something else by saying you only get this federal money if there's integrity and, and basically a state match to meet it. Yeah. So it's kind of a two part, right? It's, you can't divert the funds that you're already receiving from the sale of your own licenses, the money you're raising in your own state. Yeah. And then in order to get this money, you have to have some skin in the game too. Yep. Not a lot. 25%. But you have to have some skin in the game. And 25% to get 75%, that's a pretty big chip. And so every state in the country did it. Every state in the country passed laws that allowed them to receive this federal funding. You mentioned something else that is really interesting, which is that you you know you had this existing tax, this existing tax of roughly ten percent on long guns and ammunition, and that, but, and notably that was ended up being amended up to eleven percent at one point. But sorry, go ahead. No, that's great. That's so. But then you had the 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 industry that's being taxed saying, "Hey, look, if you're going to take this money from us and tax us." We needed to go back to that th- the thing that feeds the industry. We need to feed the goose so that the goose can keep laying the golden eggs. Yeah, and right. so let's talk about what it feeds a little bit, right? So so the act sa- – and it's worth noting that the act's been amended a couple of times over the years. Yep. So it originally was 10%. It was up to 11%. Then it was amended in the 70s to include handguns. And then it was amended to include archery equipment. Uh, and so you had these series of amendments um, to you know, that sort of round out the um, the sources of funding here. But what is it that they fund? You know, because I, we talk about how the and we've talked about on our podcast in the past how Pittman Robertson dollars fund conservation, yeah, fund conservation. But what does that really mean? You know, before you get you get into yeah. that, also you know you mentioned handguns. Um, j- ammunition for handguns things like that remember that these are all also um this isn't just this isn't just people who are hunting this is any long gun sold this is any ammunition sold sure. you know so these are you know sport shooters these are recreational shooters all those folks they're paying into this pot and in fact a large percentage of the folks that recreationally shoot are not hunters there's a big chunk of money that that comes into PR uh, into that account from recreational shooters that that might not actually be hunters or anglers. Yeah, a guy who shoots a lot of trap shoots a lot of trap. A- absolutely. In fact, uh, there there was a in the, in the prior administration it was sort of known for PR money as the Obama bump, you know, uh, because uh, there was such fear of gun regulation uh, from the federal government that actually led to a spike in in firearm and ammunition sales, which actually then created a lot more money 
for wildlife, wildlife habitat. habitat. And so that that's what I want to talk about. So what does PR do? Like I said, we, we say it funds conservation, but what does it fund? Well, it funds the acquisition and improvement of wildlife habitat. States have been able to acquire millions of acres of land around the country to use as wildlife management areas. It's been used for introduction of wildlife into suitable habitat. All these species that we talked about that we nearly lost at the beginning of the 20th century, the elk, the mule deer, the white-tailed deer, the pronghorn, mountain goats, wild sheep, all of those species, PR money allowed the states to, to reintroduce species, these species that we all know and love, into places that they hadn't been before. Or that they hadn't been in a long time, not before, but they hadn't been in a long time that humans had extirpated them from. So also research into wildlife problems like diseases. That's some of the, the funding today, figuring out wildlife disease issues, surveys and inventories of wildlife problems, acquisition and development of access facilities for public use, hunter education programs, which also includes the construction and operation of public target ranges. Nephi, you were talking about you know, how, yeah. how hunters and angler or how, how those involved in the shooting sports produce all this money. Well, some of that money that's produced can go back into some of these uh, yeah, shooting still, sport still facilities. Yeah, it's still a little bit of user pay, user benefit. Um, you bet. You know. well, and, you know, it shouldn't be overlooked. And you guys have heard me say this before. Those ranges, even for folks that th- – those ranges are very important. That's where if you're a dad and you're taking your kid out to shoot for the first time, you're introducing them or a friend or something like that. Or you just want to – you know, you bone up and be an effective hunter or marksman for the upcoming field season. Ranges are very important. You know, like any other kind of access, the, the limiting factor on people hunting and people getting into the shooting sports, it's an access issue. You have to have access to places to hunt. You have to have access to places to shoot. So we have this tax. How much money do you think it generates? Unfortunately, I know how much money yeah, it generates. Yeah, I know generates. you do. I, you were, you're supposed to pretend like you didn't. You're supposed to be like, oh, I don't know, I don't, Dave. I don't know, Dave. Tell I wish me. I, I did. Wish, how much wish, does it? How, how much, much does, does it produce? Yeah, yeah. Amaze me. <laughs> well, so 2018, this year, Secretary Zinke, uh, you know, he, he was up there, you know, as a, for a photo op you know, with a great big cardboard check, $1.1 billion sent back to the States. Now, I think that 1.1, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that 1.1 actually also included uh, money that came out of what, you, what we refer to as the Dingle Johnson Act, the Federal Aid in Sport Fish Restoration Act. I think you're right. Um, which yeah. is another law that we'll talk about another time, but it, it's, a, it's similarly constructed and it's an excise tax on fishing equipment. Yeah, yeah. but still, the, the um, Pim Robertson was more than half of that 1.1. Because yeah, in 2018, I think it was around 796 million. I think that's right. Yeah, so, so well over half. The, yeah, the majority. Yeah, uh, we're probably gonna, some very angry fishermen are going to tell us we're wrong. But <laughs> no, I mean they're they're yeah equally important sports. It's just in this instance, the firearm sales is out driving um, yeah. sport fish sales. Yeah, I, I think that's probably probably true. Yeah. Um, that PR money tends to we talk about PR because that's the one that generates the most revenue uh, that goes back to states, right? And, and <clears throat> since the inception, since the since the law was passed uh, in 1937, and then again, like the Dingle Johnson in 1950, but you, you look at that collectively, it's over $20 billion that's gone back to the states for all these on the ground programs that we were talking about. It's probably important for people to understand that, you know, that's not, it's not, you know, if you, if you buy a long gun in Wyoming, it doesn't mean that all that, you know, the, the, all that tax is being collected in Wyoming. How does that get distributed? Oh, that that's a good point because there is a very specific allocation formula, right? <laughs> so so the money that comes in, there are two different pots of money that they're looking at. They've got a pot of money that's the general wildlife restoration money, a pot of money that cr- was created in the during the seventies amendments uh, that that goes to hunters education, right? But of that wildlife restoration portion, fifty percent of the dollars. Uh, or 50% of the allocation is based on the, the area, the land area of the state. And 50% of the allocation is based on the number of licenses sold in that state. So that's that allocation. And to be fair, to be equitable to states, it's capped. So no state can receive more than 5% of the funds. And no state can receive 
less than one half of 1% of the funds for that portion. And there's a similar type of allocation formula for these um, shooting ranges for the hunter's education portion, right? Maybe not shooting range, I should say the hunter's education portion, where it's no more than 3% and no less than 1%. That allocation is actually based on the population of the state compared to the overall population of the country for that portion. But for when we're talking the on the ground projects for wildlife habitat, it's it's that based on land area and licenses sold. Yep. So in, in a way, you remember that if you live in Texas, a uh, lot bigger state, a lot larger population, very you know hunter friendly, uh, you know sportsman state. You know that state's helping Maine, and you know, that state's helping Vermont, helping these other smaller states because of that uh, that equity that they've tried to build into the formula funding mechanism because of that equation. Absolutely. And it was, it was, I think it was set up in a way, I mean, really, if you break it down and think about it, there's habitat all over the country and we have to come up with a model that equitably distributes those funds to protect and enhance habitat and wildlife across the country. And if we didn't have that kind of equity, you might see states like Texas or California um, that have large land area and large population receive the overwhelming majority of those funds like you said, to the detriment of maybe some of these other places that, that have a lot of habitat and wildlife. And, and just maybe, don't have a lot of people. But don't have a lot of people, but may need the funding, right, to help with it. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been an impactful program, to say the least. Wildlife, state wildlife agencies depend on it. It makes up a fairly significant portion of every state's wildlife budget. Um, and so... When there are actions being taken at the federal level to change it or to amend it in some way, states are going to look very closely at it, and you all should too. And that's what I want to talk about now, because there are a few bills out there that are talking about making some changes to the allocation formula of Pittman-Robertson. Nephi and Mike, do you want to talk? Who wants well, to kick us off? On I think that? Nephi can go in with it, but I think it's important just to point out before you get into the what those changes might be is a little bit of concern on the why. Um, we all know that hunter numbers potentially are declining. Um, Not potentially. I mean, they are. They've. they've yeah, I've seen. I've seen what two point two million in over the course of twenty thousand or two thousand eleven to twenty sixteen. Yeah, I mean, we well, that's the number of hunters fell by 2.2 million yeah, participants. Yeah. And then you got equipment sales dipping. You have um, other hunter-related spending going down. And so a lot of the mechanisms and the, the purchases that go into this particular fund are just, you got less people doing it. Yeah, when you have you less know, people doing it, yeah. it translates to less money going in into the pot. And that means less money going out to the states. For not just game <clears throat> species. This is all species. That's for everything. Yep. Right. So, it's used for everything. All right, Nephi. So that's, that's really down. interesting you say that, Mike, because that's exactly – so there are three bills that we're going to talk about tonight. And remember, this is, does not encompass the entire universe of efforts to 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 amend the Pittman-Robertson Act. But here are some examples of what's going on with Pittman-Robertson. So the three bills we're going to talk about tonight, um, one's H.R. 788. You're not going to remember that, but it's called the Target Practice and Marksmanship Training Support Act. The second one is 2591. It's called the Modernizing Pittman-Robertson Fund for Tomorrow's Needs Act of 2017. And the final one is called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And they, three of, the, of these bills, these three bills act in different ways to affect Pittman-Robertson funding and, and to kind of change the, the way that that act can be used. So the first one, the Target Practice and Marksmanship Training Support Act, Basically allows states it gives it allows states to have to have less skin in the game for um, developing shooting ranges, and so currently they can use a seventy five percent cost share on shooting ranges, and it would allow them to do ninety percent. So basically, you'd be able to to fund you know building or fixing shooting ranges about ninety percent with Pittman Robertson dollars, you know, through this act. And 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 why is that important? Again, because if people are, are participating in the shooting sports, if they spend a lot of money on guns and ammo, if people are teaching other people a hunter's ed class, they're probably doing it at a shooting range. And so those are that, that introduction to the, to the, to 
to hunting and shooting many times occurs at shooting ranges. And that's why they're important. That's why they would be addressed with this act. Now, really quickly, one, one of the, one of the criticisms of the act from some, right, that maybe aren't involved in the shooting sports, one of the criticisms uh, would be that it's reducing the pot of money that could be available for on the ground conservation today. And I know, you know, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, we need these, we need this to replenish. We, you know, this is a way to replenish um, our tax base, our, our shooters, our hunters. It's a recruitment tool to make sure that we have that money in the future. Um, but I just wanted to point out that it is a critique of it today, that it, it would be, theoretically reduce at least in the short term reduce yeah. the pot of money available for in the short uh, term on the ground and, and i think that the, the counter argument to that's going to be sure in the short term that might be the argument but in the long term if you don't have people paying into the system participants because that's what this is is built on then where's any of the money go, come from and so we're you know and that's the purpose of these acts is in in, in a large part to introduce people to get more people opportunity and access and basically a, a habit, a, a lifestyle, a culture of hunting and shooting sports. The second one, the modernizing now, pigment. R- really quickly before you go on, I want to mention this. So the, the Target Practice and Marksmanship Training Support Act, that's that's been sitting in the House Subcommittee on Constitution and Civil Justice since March of 2017. So just so you know the lay of the land where it is. Been sitting in committee for a while. It's been sitting in committee for a while. There's going to be a theme here where I I have a feeling we're going to get to. Um, The Modernizing Pittman Robertson Fund for Tomorrow's Needs Act of 2017 very similarly looks at kind of the long term future of Pittman Robertson Act and the need to get, and the need if that act is going to be effective over the long term at recruitment. And so it provides uh, the authorization that allows you to use PR funds to recruit, retain, and reactivate hunters and recreational shooters. So it's, it's, again, it's looking at keeping that community strong, growing that community um, so that you have people paying into the system that, you know, is benefiting these wildlife. The, the final one. And it, it, just before ahead. you go to the final one again, the, so the criticisms of that bill are the same as the criticisms of the, of the first bill you're talking about. And, let me uh, guess and, where it's at. and guess, yeah, guess where this one is. You know, it's been sitting in the House Natural Resources Committee, but not for nearly as long. Only since February of this year. Oh, I was just I was just thinking that it's kind of funny that the 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 PR fund, the Pittman Robertson fund, will be used for PR to try to recruit hunters. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> well done, yeah. nice, yeah. well done, yeah. Mike. Yeah. 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 I amuse myself. Oh, yeah, wow. well, you mo- you amuse us a little bit sometimes too. <laughs> the uh, the final act is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. This one's significantly different than the others. And that's because this one isn't looking at the same. It, this one is looking at adding 1.3 billion to per year per year to PR. And the way it's looking at doing that is not by the traditional pay. You know, the, that would more the than double, more than double the amount of money it, in it, PR. It would, but the unique part about this is you're taking money from something else and now you're putting it in. Now they're the people who would say. Well, not really. It would it, they would say what we're doing is taking one point three billion dollars in, um, in 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 basically oil, you know, uh, mineral revenue, and putting that in there with PR dollars? They're gonna say, oh well, we're using that one point three million billion. for billion, excuse yeah. me, for other species, and it allows us to use our existing PR dollars for you know stuff that's related to you know hunting, fishing, the shooting sports. But remember, it's important to remember that it. It is a different paradigm because you're, you know, you're augmenting from outside of the family, if you will, which is, you know, not the way PR has traditionally been. Right now, but I would, but I would point out, and you mentioned it, you know, that money would would be used to, to really to prevent species listings under ESA. I mean, the idea there is to de- to do research and 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 develop. You know, data and protect habitat for species that we don't know a lot about or are learning more about that aren't your traditional uh, species that that hunters and anglers would pursue. So all that money right now that that money that's in there for uh, that goes back to that goes stateside for um, for conservation projects, wildlife habitat improvement projects, can really be used. You know, 
the existing money that's being collected today can be used for things that truly benefit sportsmen. And they'll get the ancillary benefit of this additional boost of funds, right, that come in that even if it's used for these other species, it's it's going to indirectly or maybe even directly benefit some of the species they, they hunted fish. So where's this one at? So this one is sitting in uh, – this one's also in House Natural Resources. It's been there since February, and it, I, I do I do think it's still worth pointing out. That there's a big criticism of this. I mean, I'm I'm here saying the good things that could happen, but there's a criticism of this because you you mentioned it comes from offshore oil and gas revenue yeah. that currently is dumping into the general into the treasury, you know, and it's being used in the budget process to fund who knows what. Well, and it now, funds LWCF. I don't know if it's the exact same fund. Some, I mean, offshore that's, oil. Offshore oil pays for LW, LWCF, but it doesn't mean that they're taking the funds that would go to LWCF and put it it's, into this. Absolutely, right. you just compete, right. it's just competition for yeah. the same nickel. Right. What What I'm saying is, it's. I mean, this money is going somewhere, and now it could be directed here, but they're. There could be impacts. And so we have to know what the offsets are, right? And that's the argument on the Hill right now is what would the offsets be, uh, you know, in the, in the budget to make this work? Yeah. If you're going to take money out of the general treasury and divert it to something else, you've got to figure out where that's coming from, right? Right. So all three of these bills are sitting in committee and have been sitting there for periods of time. What's the calculus on where this goes? Yeah. Well, let's see. Well, we're in the summer. Of uh, the last six months of a two-year cycle on a Congress, and these bills have not advanced very far since they're sitting in the first House committee, right? Yeah, I don't um, even know if some of these have there, had There's some companion yet. bills in the, in the Senate, but hmm. there hasn't been a crossover uh, from one House of Congress to the next. Don't even know if there's been a markup yet. Right. So so you're, you're looking at the next um, six months to get anything done. And what else does Congress have to work on? They've got to figure out appropriations. They've got to um, try to process through nominations to fill various vacancies within the federal government that have been uh, nominated by the president. And they've uh, a lot of people are going to be running for, for re-election. So um, I'm not going to give high hopes on uh, these making it through the traditional bicameral legislative process where it gets presented to the president in the normal process. But it doesn't mean you should give up on it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are ways to, uh, to influence and to keep this on the radar of the right people. If these are bills that you are passionate about. And I know Nephi, you've got thoughts on how to go about doing that. Yeah. If these are important to people, people need to remember, you know, first of all, that a lot of these great ideas, if they're important to you, they get incorporated, they get, they, they pieces of different acts that are out there very frequently these now at this time are getting pulled and recombined kind of amalgamated into into larger efforts like Murkowski Sportsman's Act which was passed this last year and so if these are important to you you need to reach out to your representatives you need to reach out to your senators and tell them what concepts here are important to you so that those things can be so that they can become part of deals so they can become part of discussion and, and attached to pieces of legislation that somebody might consider a must move piece of legislation. And if you're a member of a, an organization that supports one of these, you know, let, let, let your, your organization, organization know. know that you're there to help, you know, and offer to, to do groundwork is a lot of these things start at the ground level at the local level, uh, to build momentum, um, uh, before you see the change at the federal level. So I think, I think with that, it's probably a good place to leave. Yeah, it's a fair representation of right? the, what we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah. call your congressman <laughs> if you want to be, or don't. <laughs> if you if you care about something, call. Absolutely, call or write. And the same goes for us. Let us know what you think. We look more forward to bringing you more great content as we go forward. Um, this has been the Your Mountain Podcast, and and we'll see you next time. Mike here from the Your Mountain Podcast. We need a favor. Go on our website, itsyourmountain.com, and find the links to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so that you can like and follow us, and also so that you can share us with your friends. 
wherever you got this podcast from, go ahead and click subscribe, rate us, and leave a comment. These simple things will really help us get the word out. That's itsyourmountain.com. Thanks for the help.